Hello, this is Sheila Bender, and you are listening to In Conversation, Discussions on Writing and the Writing Life. Today we have with us Bainbridge Island resident Beth Bacon. She's a writer of children's books, including middle grade, picture books, and poetry. She received her MFA in Creative Writing for Children and Young Adults from Vermont College of Fine Arts and is fascinated with the creative process. She asks, how is it when we write that our characters somehow take on a life of their own? Beth grew up in Boston, where she got a B.A. in literature from Harvard College, then moved to New York City, where she got an M.A. in media ecology from NYU. From there, she followed her heart to far-flung cities, including Seattle, Monterey, San Diego, and Tokyo. In 2008, she and her adventurous family took a year off and traveled to all 50 states in a motorhome. Before finding her voice as a children's book author, Beth wrote serial commercials, computer demos, and business case studies. Beth is the winner of the Vermont College of Fine Arts Candlewick Award for Picture Books and the Marion Dane Bauer Award for Middle Grade. Welcome, Beth. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. I'm so glad to be asking you some questions today that spring right from your bio. Okay. I'd like to know about media ecology. It's not a term I've actually come across before, and I think of it as quite an interesting one for a writer to have in her background. Can you tell us more about what that degree was? I like to think of media ecology as communication theory. It's a bunch of people sitting around thinking about how we communicate, not just what we say, but how do the media that we use to communicate affect what we say. For example, culture that is getting most of its information through television is going to do the political process a little bit differently than a culture that's getting most of its information through the internet or Twitter. There are just different kinds of information that are best suited for each medium. And this group of people studies that. So Marshall McLuhan jumps to mind for me. The medium is the message. Is that kind yep, of what- Marshall McLuhan's work were the cornerstones of what we studied. And basically, like, it's great to think about it in terms of the political process. The kinds of speeches that Abraham Lincoln gave live were much longer and more complicated than the kinds of speeches that John F. Kennedy made in the 60s on television. And they're very, very different than the kinds of sound bites that are going across the Internet now. So as we move through technologies in our culture... The actual messages that we say also change. So do you think that your writing for children is influenced by your background in media ecology? (laughs) I think about that a lot in that my medium is writing on paper. Uh, I have a son who's in college, and he has a lot of the same thoughts and ideas that I do, but his medium is computer games. And so he considers computer games a form of narrative, storytelling, and he's studying to become a computer game designer. So he's using his medium, and I'm using my medium. I have a younger brother who much more was influenced by television and the movies, and he writes screenplays, and so that's his medium. So I do think that something to be taken into account, and for me, writing on paper with words or on the computer with words is is the medium where I feel most comfortable. You're kind of (laughs) old-fashioned. I'm I'm pretty old school, absolutely. And the most far-flung I get is translating my written stuff into e-books versus paper books. And is that because children Uh, are reading e-books? Children are reading e-books, but actually children mostly read paper books these days because they're getting them in schools and at the library. And so actually children are one of the last to adopt e-books as a sort of demographic group. It's kind of interesting. Very interesting. But kids love technology. And so if their parents will let them get their hands on their Kindles, they will certainly read using them. Can you foresee Uh, your son writing a computer game based on one of your books? (laughs) That would be really cool. Perhaps. My books are actually sort of more thoughtful and literary as opposed to adventurous. I think that maybe like an adventure story would probably translate into a computer game a little better. I see. Well, let's go back to another question I have from your bio, which is about the awards you won. One is called the Candle Wick Award for Picture Books, and the other one, the Marion Dane Bauer Award. And I think they both have very interesting backgrounds. Can you tell us about them? Sure. The Candle Wick Award is an award given out to a student at Vermont College of Fine Arts for a picture book text 
It doesn't include the pictures. It's just the words. And the editors at Candlewick, which in my opinion is probably the premier children's book publisher in the country, they pick a manuscript from the pile and give out the award. And they selected mine, which was actually kind of surprising because it was a picture book that actually is a wordless picture book. And so the text of my picture book, speaking of various um, media, was just a description of what the artist would draw on every page. And so it was kind of unusual when I submitted it. I had no expectations of it winning at all. In fact, when they described it in the award ceremony, the first thought that came to my mind is like, wow, someone wrote a book with the same plot as mine. <laughs> because I had, I just didn't think that it would ever win because it was very unusual and that it was a description of a wordless picture book. How would that work, for instance? What did you describe? It's a description of a, actually a, a frustrated writer who's trying to write a love letter. The ink on the pen gets away from him and goes out into the world and has a little adventure and in the end writes a message to the woman that the man was trying to write the letter to, and she gets the message. I just felt when I was coming up with the idea that it would be best portrayed not with words, so I just described the illustration. Hopefully, Candlewick will give it to an illustrator then the illustrator will take the ideas and draw them on the page, and the, and the book itself will have no word. Ah, that was going to be my question. So I would think that Candlewick would be excited to offer this possibility to an artist, and I think that's a stunningly interesting idea. Is this for children, uh, the idea of a love letter, or is it one of those adult picture books? That's another reason why I had no expectations of it ever winning. The wisdom today is that children's books are only for children, and something that has a broader audience or an adult audience isn't really applicable. And so we'll see. I think that kids are smart people. They're mature people. I think that the story is sort of a timeless story. So I think both kids and adults would get it. But I also kind of as a marketing person would see like, boy, that kind of a story would be a great little gift to give somebody on Valentine's Day amongst grown-ups. Absolutely. Sort of like the way a Dr. Seuss book is often given to kids when they graduate from high school, the book, Oh, the Places You'll Go. Mm-hmm. So it could have that possibility also. Oh, that's exciting. I hope you hear from them soon. And I hope it's a positive. I'm looking now at the word serial commercials in your bio and thinking about telling a story with no words and thinking about media. And are there ways in which writing for commercials, and I take that was for TV, is there a way Mm -hmm. in which that has influenced your writing for children? Absolutely. Every advertising writer is a storyteller. You actually come up with a script and you put it down on paper and then you create it just like you would create a movie or any other story. And the great discipline that I learned in doing that is how not to waste words because a 15-second commercial is very, very short. You have to have a beginning, a middle, and an end. And so how do you do that in such a short time? It really was a great discipline to try to come up with commercials. It was really fun. Plus, the um, visual aspect is really important. Yeah, the way that it works in advertising is that every writer gets paired up with an art director, a person who's responsible for what it looks like. So the writer is responsible for sort of the story and the words and the script, and the art director is in charge of what it looks like, whether it'll have, let's say it's a serial commercial that takes place in the kitchen. The art director gets to design what that kitchen looks like or or go and, and scout out kitchens and then also pick the people. What do they look like and what are they wearing? I can see how working with them has possibly helped you imagine scenes and imagine what things look like in your book. So tell us about the Mary and Dane Bauer Award for middle grade, what that entailed and what you submitted Sure. Marion Dane Bauer is a Newbery Medal winner. Newbery Medal, I think, is the most prestigious award for children's book authors. And she's also a retired instructor at the school that I went to, Vermont College of Fine Arts. So there's an award for middle grade writers that is named after her. And my middle grade piece also got selected for that. The story is, is one that I'm working on now. It's currently in progress. I'm almost done with it. It's about a 10-year-old girl whose dad works for a demolition derby, 
And she and her dad move around the country all the time, and she wants nothing more than to stay in one town and put down roots there. And so this is a story of the girl struggling to sort of find her voice to tell her dad that she really wants to stay put in this town and not keep moving around. Is this the book that you have prepared something to read from for us? It is. Would this be a good time then to turn to that? Sure, I would be happy to read it. The little blurb that I pulled out of this book is kind of at the beginning, but not the very beginning. So I think to set it up, what you need to know is that there's a girl named Vivian, or Viv. She's 10, and she has just rolled into a new fairground, and she really wants to stay in this town. And she's talking to her friend named Elvis. Elvis is the only other kid in the Traveling Demolition Derby crew. Impossible, says Elvis. He takes one last whack at a nail, securing a piece of plywood onto the front of the ticket taker's stand. Not, Viv folds her arm and leans against the side of the booth. Ain't no way your daddy's going to settle down in Lindale, Washington. Elvis wipes the back of his hand across his forehead, just under the bill of his Tennessee Titans ball cap. When he pulls it away, his forehead is streaked with dirt. And get back or the whole booth will fall down. Sure, it's possible. Viv steps away from the half-built structure, doing exactly what Elvis asks. Because even though he's the only other kid on the Daniel C. Glickmeyer traveling crew, and practically her brother, he's 14 and Viv's only 10. He's been starting to change a little, going off on his own and ignoring her more. Viv knows Elvis doesn't need to be letting her hang around all the time. All we ever do is settle in, then pack up. Settle in, then pack up. Aren't you sick of building up and tearing down that old, rickety, ticket-taking house every time the derby goes to a new fairground? Goes up quick, Elvis shrugs. And he's right. It's only been a few minutes, and the ticket house is already complete. There's a counter up front a door in the back, and two little seats inside. Viv and Elvis used to play in it when they were little, whenever someone wasn't selling derby tickets. Push on the wall, says Elvis. See if it's sturdy. Viv gives the old house a big old shove with her shoulder. She can't make it budge. You did good, Elvis. Oh, and Viv? Elvis latches his toolbox with a snap. Don't call me Elvis no more. Remember what I told you down in Del Mar? I'm Ethan now. That's exactly the kind of thing that's happening with Elvis. Okay, Ethan. So hear me out and tell me this ain't possible. When I was walking around out in town, I saw a sign in a gas station. They're looking for someone to fix cars. There's no better mechanic than my daddy anywhere. Viv squats and draws a infinity sign in the dirt. He could get that job, then we'd stay right here in this very town. Elvis sits on the ground next to Viv. He gathers his lanky knees in his elbows. Your daddy's got a real good gig going, he says. He gets to turn old dead heaps into rock star monster cars. What's he going to do in some gas station? Change out some old lady spark plugs? Anything's possible. Viv adds loops to the infinity sign, so now it looks like a flower. Over to their right, Viv's daddy is backing out that new demo car off the trailer, while Elvis's pa, Daniel C. Glickmeyer himself, barks orders in his ringmaster voice. Elvis shakes his head. One more time, he says, impossible. It's not impossible. Viv stops drawing and plants her stick in the dirt. Fine. Elvis bangs his shoulder into hers. Almost impossible. Viv breaks out in a smile. That's more like it. Now you see the world like I do. Seeing the world like you do, Elvis shakes his head, is like reading a fairy tale. Fairy tales are almost impossible, says Viv, but every single one of them comes out the way you want it to in the end. Thank you, Beth. Of course, I think we know that it will come out the way she wants to, but probably not without some difficulties and surprises. 
You are listening to KPTZ 91.9 Port Townsend. In case you've just joined us, you are listening to In Conversation with Sheila Bender, discussions on writing and the writing life. Sheila is talking with Bainbridge Island children's book writer Beth Bacon about her writing awards and the ways in which she has found surprises along the way. That brings me to wanting to talk to you about that very element of surprise, which you've addressed in your bio, saying our characters somehow take on a life of their own. And in conversations with me and email, you've mentioned how that aspect of surprise is one of the most important parts of writing. So I wondered what you'd like to tell us about that in your experience. Well, I'm just so fascinated with what happens when you're writing fiction and you're writing along and something that you didn't expect pops up. In this very story, there's a scene where Viv is driving along with her daddy and they get a flat tire. And while he's fixing the tire, she climbs a tree in the orchard and is looking around. And I'm writing the story and I'm talking about how she can hear the bees buzzing and feel the wind blowing. And then all of a sudden, the splash came to me and it was a girl riding her bicycle through the orchard. And I had no idea who she was or what she was doing in the story. And and it completely surprised me. And, and I just sort of wrote down what I saw and what the splash was, I had no idea. Is this an important character in the story? Is she going to become friends with Viv? And the only thing I knew is that this girl was the girl that dropped the nails on the road that caused them to get a flat tire. So she was doing something really bad, and I had no idea why. I was writing it at that point as part of an assignment, and so I had a nice little break after that and before I had to sort of continue on with it. And that's one nice thing about writing for school, because you're not forced to sort of keep going. Um, You're actually forced to break in your writing. And after I had a a month or so break, I went back to it. And and I did decide that, yeah, this is an interesting character. And she is not a nice character, but she might be a really good foil to Viv. And so I wrote some additional scenes of the two of them meeting up with each other and interacting. And it turns out that this girl is actually trying to save the orchard from developers. And she gets together with Viv and the two of them try to save the orchard in this town where Viv wants to live. Ah, so you have a whole subplot going on because of the image that just came to you of this girl on a bicycle riding through the orchard. Do you feel like you had a willingness to find out what she was doing there rather than an intent to make her do something Yeah, you know, it's always a balance between your intentions as an author and your willingness to be open to whatever pops up. And I think that actually becoming a more mature writer is not just your writing skills, like which adverbs to use or not use, but to decide when things pop up in your writing, how do you address them? Do you go back and embellish it and and make it more important? Or do you cut it out? That's a skill that you sort of, the more mature you are as a writer, the more you can sense what's the right thing for the story and what isn't. So you sensed that this girl was the right thing for your story? Yeah, I sensed that this girl was the right thing for the and, story, and absolutely. When, but there were other things that I said, oh, we should cut. Uh-huh. So, <laughs> you never really know if you're right or wrong. And you just figure it out as you go along or when you're all done? Or think you're yeah, all done. absolutely. You figure it out as you go along, and then that's why it's always sort of disheartening to like finish a draft and then say like, okay, now I need to go back and revise it. But the beauty of being able to do that is to go back and revise it after you've discovered all those surprising things. Then you go back and kind of are able to judge: are these details something we should include or not? Does that make sense? It does, and I also know there's a kind of magic to the whole thing. Just like we talk about getting in flow when we're writing, I think we also get in flow when we're revising. And kind of our Mm. story talks Mm -hmm. to us in some way and lets us know what sounds clunky now, what seems clunky now, what slows down the motion of the story, the momentum. What you're saying makes perfect sense. It's also a really hard thing to describe. It's more a thing that is an action. You're involved in the revision. Does that sound right to you? Yeah, and it's also something that you have to be a reader of the story yourself and say, am I liking this? Does this have the energy going in the right direction? If not, then 
that's the hard decision. Like, what do I do about it? Right. When you say, do I like this story? I think the other question, the other part of that question is, or am I making myself like this story? (laughs) Because I think we can fool ourselves as writers because we're invested in what we already wrote. I think we can feel the difference between really enjoying it and wanting to make ourselves enjoy it so we can say we've finished our story. Yeah, so that actually is such an interesting point because it's the idea of your intention as the author and the story's own intention. And I actually have a quote that you once told me that I want to read. It it goes like this. Many people think their writings are about what I wanted to say, but they aren't. They are about what the words tell you they want to say. Always something deeper, more disturbing, or more beautiful than you were intending or thought you knew. Wow. Did you take notes while I was talking to you? (laughs) No, you said that to me in an email a couple of years ago when I asked you about this question, because I have been thinking about this question all along. It's such a fascinating question to me. It's you as a writer start with an intention and you create something called a text. And that text actually somehow develops its own meaning. And we as writers have to serve that text the way it needs to communicate and not the way we intend it to. And so it's such a balance between something we are creating, but the thing that we create somehow has a life of its own. And the trick is how to honor that. How to recognize it, how to honor it, what to do with it. (laughs) Right. I'm thinking about how so many writers, including myself, especially at the beginning, say, what do I have to write about that's important enough to write about? And it's a good question, but the answer is, you will never know unless you start writing. That even if your life has not had anything extraordinary in it, your reflections, your response to the world around you, your imagination are extraordinary, but you can't find them until you engage in the process and hit the wall that we're talking about, which is, what do I do with the unexpected and how do I allow the unexpected in? I think one thing a writer can always be guaranteed, that is if you enter the process, those surprises will come. You just have to allow and notice them. Do you have some ideas about how we can help this happen more often? That's a really good question because it's not something that you can just have a formula for and then say, like, I know I'm going to sit down today and write and I'm going to be surprised with what comes out. It doesn't happen that way. But I have thought about it a lot and there are things that we can do to make it happen more often. One of them is to do a lot of side writing, write sort of stuff that you, especially if you're writing fiction, just stuff that you don't think is going to end up in the story itself but have a conversation. Let's say it's a children's book. Write a scene of the two grown-ups in the story talking to each other over beer. That would never happen in the story, but it might reveal something about their characters or their own needs and desires that inform you as an author and inform the story. So side writing is also good because you're not so pressured to find the perfect word. And you might find something wonderful in that. Do you have some any other mm-hmm. ideas for this? Well, one thing is to what you said before is just write, 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 write. The surprises won't come up if you don't sit there and, and write them out. So those magical moments sort of are like the little nuggets of gold that you find when you're gold mining. You still got to get out there and sort of swish around the slosh in, in your gold mining pan. And every once in a while, you've got a golden nugget that appears. But, if, but you'll never find the gold if you don't go mining one thing. Just do it. And be messy. Just like kids are messy. Kids build towers and they (laughs) knock them down and they splash around in the mud, just like you're talking about gold mining. Being messy is hard for adults, but allowing yourself to be is is really an invitation, I think, for the surprise. And you were going to add something? And just to add to the messiness, I think that I was, as an early writer, I was so intent on getting something polished and perfect that I was actually stifling the surprises that could come up. So yes, being messy is like super important. You can clean it up later, you can edit later, but those magical moments only come up when you're open to open to messiness. I agree. Yeah. And we only have a couple more minutes and I, I want to be sure to ask you this question. A lot of people want to write a children's book 
and they say, I have a children's book. I, I know it's a children's book. Can you quickly tell us what's the first step they should take, just the first step, to get involved in writing for children? Is your question like what should they do or what is a children's book? No, it's what should they do. And maybe it is find out oh. what a children's book is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, generally a children's book is really some uh, a story where the sort of point of view in the narrative is a child's point of view as opposed to an adult perhaps remembering their childhood. Really this would be like the, the child or teenager is the, is the point of view of the story. And I would say the best thing to do if you're just starting out is to join the SCBWI. It's a Society of Children, Book, Writers, and Illustrators. It's kind of a mouthful, but it's a wonderful, wonderful organization, and there are chapters in every city all around the world. And they have conferences and meetups, and you can get to know people that could perhaps join you in a writing group. And it's all dedicated to writers of children's books. Thank you. And very quickly now, I just want to tell the listening audience that I happen to know that Beth has one child in college, one about to go, and has taken on a pretty intensive work experience in order to help raise some funds for that and has let go one of her websites. But you can still find her there. And would you tell us what the name of that website is? Sure. The website is called ebooks and kids. Dot com, and it's kind of a mouthful. It's E with a dash, books and A-N-D, kids.com. And in the past, I was helping other writers publish their books as e-books because that's a whole other adventure going down the road. Once you've got your book written and edited, how do you turn it into an e-book? It's possible. It's doable. On that website, I did have lots of tips about it. But these days I'm not actively working on it, although maybe in the future I'll be able to support it again. But people still may find it interesting with the addendum that the technology changes all the time, and that's something people have to constantly research, what technology is required. But Beth, thank you so much for this conversation and for helping us see into the life of a person writing for children. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. You're welcome. It was great to be here. You have been listening to In Conversation, Discussions on Writing and the Writing Life with Sheila Bender. For more of Sheila's interviews, please go to Sheila's website, www.writingitreal.com slash audio. In Conversation is produced by Sheila Bender and edited by Charlie Fleischman. Announcer is Kurt Vanderslice.